uh, we all probably know that there are special moments that you get with specific people, right? Like some, some moments that are special between uh, re- different relationships. One of those, uh, I can't recall like it was yesterday. It was with my grandma on my mom's side of the family. Her name was Gabriela. And uh, she, I remember the last time I went to visit as a student uh, on a, over a Christmas break. And we spent some time, you know, just eating good food and celebrating and having a good time. And I had to go back to school. And my grandma was one of those ladies that was tough. She was toughened by life, I think. She was just, uh, you know, not uh, super lovey-dovey. She would just kind of hug you and pat you in the back and send you your way, or pat you in the back of the head, send you your way. But I remember this specific time we were at the airport, and uh, I just, she wouldn't let go. And it was different for me. And uh, she was just always, you know, as she was hugging me. She was telling me all these pieces of advice, you know, last minute things that she wanted to say. And I could hear her voice crack. And I didn't really know exactly why she felt different this way. But uh, little did I know that was the last time that I would see her, you know, in person. Now, I got to see her and talk to her over the phone, but not in person. Uh, The next time that we went, she had passed away. And I remember that always. And it was that little hug that was holding a little tighter than normal. And that's something that I hold special in, in my mind. And I remember the same thing happened kind of with my mom the very last time that we saw her. But uh, sometimes we have special moments that we take for granted, right? There are other moments that, that we take for granted, like hearing I love you all the time. Like maybe for some of you, you are used to hearing that. You don't even think about it, but I want you to know that's special. That's a moment that's special, and you need to cherish e- each and every one of those moments when someone tells you I love you. And maybe you need to say that more often. There are some moments that, you know, maybe we don't take for granted, like, the noise that our kids or our teens make. For those of you who are empty nesters, you probably realize, you know, like, hey, that is a special moment. Like, the house is so quiet when they're not here. And some of us are saying, like, amen, you know, the house is so quiet when they're not here. Praise the Lord. But I want you to know that special moment. Or when kids yell as they're little, watch me, mom, watch me, daddy, watch me, watch me, watch me. Remember that? It's like, yes, I've watched you 15 times. How many more times do you want me to watch you? but they want you to be proud of them. That's a special moment. Uh, Or maybe, for me, one of the things that my mom used to do all the time is, like, she would always ask me, did you eat already? Like, mom, you look at me. I ate already multiple times today, right? But that was something that she would always ask. And you don't realize that you've taken that for granted until it's gone, until no one asks you if you have eaten already, or no one tells you I love you, or there is just quietness in the house, or the kids don't yell, watch me. Sometimes repetition makes special moments feel kind of ordinary, feel like they're just there. Like I remember, you know, the, the first time that my kids called me dad, right, dada, dad. And then all of a sudden they're saying dad, 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 or mom, 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 so often that you're like, okay, stop. Or maybe for some of you younger people, the first time that you drive, you get to drive by yourself, and you feel such an adult, right, such a big person, until you realize that your parents are going to use you as the family chauffeur to drive your siblings around, right? So repetition sometimes can take the specialness out of, you know, makes the special things ordinary. Or remember when you held for the very first time, for those of you who are married, the first time that you held your, your husband or your wife's hand, and it was just, you know, you feel the butterflies, you know, right there. And now the only thing that you can think about when you hold, you know, his or her hand is like, man, honey, you need to put a little more moisturizer right there, right? So special moments can be either threatened by repetition or can be threatened because we take them for granted. And moments, special moments with God are threatened by the same things. For example, remember when worshiping together just touch you, touch every part of you. You know, almost to the point of tears, there were some songs that just hit different and, and you just knew that you needed more of the Lord. Or remember when you would read your Bible and you craved God's Word, that you would, you know, listen to a message and then go online and listen to another message and then open your Bible and just highlighted it and wrote notes on it and you just were so hungry for God's Word. Or remember the first time that you gave sacrificially 
whenever you trusted that Lord, the Lord would provide for you, and He did. And that was, you know, such a moment in your life. And today, we're going to talk about this act that we do every week called communion. See, if you're new with us, we're in a series called Sacred Moments. Because there are some things that God wants us to experience with Him that bring us closer to Him and closer to, to, to each other. In fact, uh, Luke 22, 14 and 15 tells us how Jesus just wanted to have this time of communion with His disciples. Verse 14 says, When the hour came, Jesus and His apostles reclined at the table. And He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I love the Greek, how it's written in Greek. It says, with desire, I have desired to do this. That's, that's the literal translation. I have eagerly desired, it's translated in the NIV. I really have longed to do this. Jesus really wanted to spend some time with his disciples in taking this Passover dinner to create a new moment of connection with them. And Jesus still wants to use that communion as a moment to connect with you and me. But repetition sometimes makes it ordinary. I don't know how long you've been a Christian, but if you've been a Christian for at least a few years, you know here at Harvester we do it every week, and you are tempted each week to disregard what you do here. To take it as a moment of just to blank out, right? To just kind of space out and just go somewhere else. Maybe you're thinking about you know, what you're going to do for lunch. Maybe you're thinking about the game that's coming on and the preacher keeps talking on and on and I just need him to quit so we can go home, right? Maybe you just are thinking about, man, I need to get out. And maybe you skip communion from time to time because you want to get first to the check checkout line at children's ministry because you want to go home. You don't want to be stuck in line. We are tempted to just disregard what communion is about. But in doing so, in missing communion, you may be missing Jesus. Fortunately, we're not alone in this. The church from the very beginning has struggled to keep first things first. And so we are given some instructions. In one of the letters from the Apostle Paul, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to read verses 20 through 22 because the church in Corinth also struggled to keep communion sacred as a sacred moment for the church. Listen to verse 20 through 22. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. You know, over the years, I think the church has struggled to keep communion as a sacred moment. In fact, many churches, because of this danger of repetition, they don't celebrate it each, you know, every week. They, they keep it to specific times during the year. And, and here's the, the one thing that I tell you. I think that from the biblical standpoint, it's not a sin to not do it every week. But I definitely see in Scripture that people met to take the Lord's Supper. They were not meeting to listen to a message. They were not meeting to worship necessarily. They were meeting to, to take part, to participate in the Lord's Supper. And I think we need to keep it, in, you know, first and foremost in our services. Unfortunately, in many churches, this has become uh, like a thing that we do on the side, right? COVID made it even worse, right? Remember during COVID when we, we, we if you were meeting at home or you were just watching online, it's one of those things that is like, oh, you forgot to go get grape juice, so you're using orange juice for it. NyQuil, if that's all you have, that's what you're pulling out, right? And whatever kind of bread, maybe a tortilla, I don't know. You're using all kinds of things, and it, it seems like it just became mundane. It became ordinary. And so this, this week is a call for us to just make communion sacred again. 1 Corinthians 11, it talks about this church, how they were divided. I want you to know that communion is about the unity of the church. It's about understanding that we're one in Christ. You know, back then, what was happening is that people were eating by families. It's like they forgot that we were one family in Christ. And so it was a full meal that they were participating in. And they would gather at different places. And so then I would bring, you know, my dinner for my family. And then you bring dinner for your family. Well, there were wealthy people throwing a feast and there were other people that barely had enough to live on. 
And Paul says, you're not even sharing with one another. Like there is someone getting drunk over here, and then there is someone that has nothing. He's going hungry. He's like, you know what? Let's stop doing this. You guys eat at home. And what we're going to do here is going to be something different. Paul was concerned because when we waste moments that we're meant to connect us to each other and to God, we're missing each other and we're missing Jesus. And so Paul addresses this actually the chapter before already. He has already addressed it once. And he gives us the meaning of communion as he's talking about idolatry. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 verses 14 through 17 says this, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. It's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ... And it's not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. So what Paul is saying is that this is more than just remembering something, right? This is a participation. Every Christian throughout the, the, the centuries, when we participate in the bread and the cup, we're saying we are part of one church, one kingdom, that is under one king, Jesus, and we need to remember that we are not doing it alone. My Christianity is not just me and God, it's us and God. You know, America and and the Western world is really bad about individualism, right? We we think we can do it on our own, it's just me and the world, me and God. and, And we need to remember that Christ wanted us to remember that it's us. It's us together and and God. And so Paul wants us to know that what we're doing is a sharing in, a fellowship, a participation. So here's what I want you to know this morning. Through communion, we together participate in the new Exodus covenant, in the new covenant made possible through Jesus Christ. Why do I say Exodus covenant or exit covenant? Because we need to remember the setting of the first Lord's Supper, the first communion. It was during a, a, a feast called Passover, a celebration called Passover. And for us to understand what this celebration was about, we need to go to the first Passover. And so we're going to go to Exodus 12, but you don't have to go there on your Bibles. We're not going to read it. I'm going to summarize it for you. You can, I definitely encourage you, go read it later on this week. But the first Passover happened when the people of Israel were in Egypt. They were in slavery. And they were trying to, to get out of that slavery. God had promised them that it would become free. And Moses is talking to Pharaoh back and forth, and and Pharaoh promises, I'm going to let you go. But then he changes his mind, and he does this nine times. And God has had it, he's had enough, and he says, I'm going to deliver you tonight. So here's what is going to happen. Tonight, the destroyer is going to come, and every firstborn in Egypt will die. And yours could too, but I'm going to give you a sign of a covenant. You're going to take a lamb, and you're going to slaughter it. And you're going to take some of that blood and put it on the top of your doorposts and on the sides. And then you're going to cook the lamb, and you're going to eat it. And you're going to cook some bread without yeast, because you don't have time for the bread to rise. Because you're leaving tonight, and you're going to eat this with some bitter herbs. And and you're going to eat the the lamb and the bread, and, and that blood needs to be over your doorposts. And then you're going to eat it in a specific way. You're not going to sit down and relax. You're actually going to tuck your cloak into your belt so that you can run. You're going to leave your sandals on. And you're going to have your staff in your hand. This is how you're going to eat it. Because today, through judging Egypt, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to give you freedom from this slavery you're in. And so it happened. The destroyer came and Egypt was judged by God. And they finally released the Israelites. They let them go. And Israel was freed from slavery. And then Jehovah or Yahweh told Moses, you're going to remember this by doing this same dinner that you did tonight every year. So this dinner of Passover was called Passover because it was the night that through the blood of this lamb as a sign, by the sign of this blood on the doorposts, the destroyer knew this is a house that belongs to God, so I'm not going to destroy anyone here. So he passed over some families, the families that had this on their, as a sign. And so Jesus, you know, thousands of years later, is sitting there with his disciples. 
and is participating in the same feast, and he changes the meaning. And he says, now this bread that you're eating is not going to be, it's not a bread, you know, to deliver you, to remind you of the deliverance from Egypt, but it's a bread that is about to be broken. This is going to be my body that is going to be crushed. It's going to be broken, really. It's given for you, and, uh, and, and it represents you being freed from slavery to sin. It's going to represent me rescuing you, redeeming you, your lives from sin so that you can be close to God. In, my, in this cup, Jesus says, it's going to re- represent my blood that is being shed, that, is, that gives life to you. As, as I'm dying and I'm taking your place, now you get to live. And so he changes the meaning, and he tells them the same thing. He says, and by the way, you need to do it to remember what I'm doing here this week for you. And so the church, ever since its beginning, uh, they were doing it. They've been doing it sometimes, it seems in the Bible, like they did almost daily. And then it seems like they kind of did it on the first day of the week. We see in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And so we see that the church has been doing it. But in doing so, repeating it so many times, we can get sidetracked. And so today what I'm going to give you over the next few minutes is, how do we make communion sacred again? Uh, the Apostle Paul is really telling us how to do it, so I'm just going to start reading there in verse uh, 24 and 25. It says that the Lord gave him this and, and told them that when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took, that's Jesus, took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So what we get is that Jesus, one of his disciples, every time they take the bread and the cup, every time they participate together in this ceremony to remember him, he says, like, you need to look back at this night. You need to look back at the next three days. What I, what about to, what's about to happen? That I'm, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to give my life for you. So the first thing that you need to do is look back. Remember the price the Christ paid for you. Every time you take communion, the first thing that you probably need to do is look back, look at Jesus. I, I want you to just think about the prize that he put on your life that he gave his life for you. And I tell you what, that sounds, you know, we've said it so many times, maybe you are desensitized to that. But let me put it, give you a different perspective. Uh, one of the documentaries that you know, I've watched was really impactful was uh, one that talks about uh, one of the documentaries on 9-11, on um, the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center in 2001 that made an impact on me was one that talked about a man with a red bandana. His name was Wells Crowther, and uh, he worked at the South Tower, the World Trade Center in the South Tower, and when the North Tower was hit, Everybody was asked to evacuate both towers. And so, you know, he called his mom and he said, Mom, I'm okay. I'm in the South Tower. You know, I'm okay. And so he was walking down and they were waiting for elevators at the 78th floor in the South Tower when at 9.02, the second airplane hit the South Tower right above where they were. And, you know, I mean, everybody that survived that moment, you know, just remembers like there was a big explosion we were blown back it's darkness smoke no one knew what to do no one wanted to move because you didn't know if the floor in front of you was gonna just collapse but Wells Crowder stood up and crawled around did whatever he could looking for the staircase that was okay to go down he found one when he found one, he yelled to everybody I found the staircase I need everybody to follow me and one of the ladies that, you know, survived the event, she says, like, we didn't know who he was, but he just looked so confident that we just all followed. And so Wells walks, you know, a bunch of people down from the 78th floor to the 61st floor where there was another staircase and firefighters were waiting there. And, and one other survivor says, you know, it's amazing because he could have just kept walking with us. But he decided at this point, once we found firefighters, he decided he was going to turn around and go and help other people. And uh, he went back, and from 9.02 to 9.59, which is when the tower collapsed, 
he helped at least 12 different people that survived the event that recall, recall you know, him helping. Now, no one knew his name at the time. It was later when they looked back at what had happened that they, there was these 12 different people recall a man with a red bandana just kind of covering himself with the smoke, using it to help people when people had blood in their eyes. You know, that's what he would use to kind of help him see. And, and so you, you may wonder, how did they figure out who he was? Well, the reason why his parents realized that it was him helping is because when he was little, his dad on one occasion told him, he gave him a, a white handkerchief, and he said, you know, the white is for show. He put it in his pocket. And then he gave him a red bandana, and he said, the red is for blow, to blow his nose. And so he always remembered that, that the Y is for show, and the other one is for blow. So he always kept a red bandana in his pocket. And he was, you know, he worked at World Trade Center, and he was a part-time firefighter. So he always carried that with him. And, and people started recalling, and, you know, in the recollections, they started to write, it was just a man with the red bandana. And so his parents finally started to see it, and they took a picture of him to them, and people recognize him. Yes, it's Wells Crowther. And, and I tell you what, sometimes you need to look back to pick up on the things that someone did for you. And these people that had survived the, the terrorist attack in 2001 are so thankful for a man who had the courage to go back upstairs and save them, to take him and lead him wherever they needed to go. They're so grateful that he was there and that he laid down his life for the sake of others. Jesus said, there is no greater love than to lay your life for that one of a fellow human, right? And so what I want you to know is when we take communion, the first thing that we need to do is look back at the life of Jesus and see what he did. His teaching, his sacrifice to realize that Jesus is not the man with the red bandana, but he's the man with the crown of thorns that died for you on the cross so that you and I could uh, have redemption of our sins from our sins. Communion is a way to remember that as his blood was shed, as his blood was leaving his body, life came out from him so that you and I could be spared. And the other thing that you can look back at is what Christ has done in your life specifically. Think about where you would be without Jesus today. Where would your life be? And count your blessings. Here's the second thing that we can do. We need to look forward as we remember Jesus is coming to restore all things. We need to look forward and remember that Jesus is coming to restore all things. Here's what verse 26 says. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord said that he would not drink of this juice fruit of the vine, until he came back and established his kingdom. You know, one of the interesting things is that when we take communion, we're not only looking back, it's a proclamation of the gospel. I love it that we do it here every week. In fact, when we visit other churches, one of the things that I miss the most is taking communion and, and just spending that time with God's body, you know, with the Lord. Because uh, I feel like communion is one of those things that uh, the church is a sermon represented in tangible ways. Is the, the message of the gospel represented. Is the body of Christ, you know, being, in a sense, ripped apart, broken. It also represents the unity of the church, and it represents the blood that was shed, given for us, you know, so that we could have life, so that we could have forgiveness of sins. And through communion, all this is represented. But here's the great thing. The Christ wants this to be a proclamation. If you think about it, if you're new with us and you don't know anything about Christianity, if you didn't know anything about Christianity, coming to a place where people are gathering and are having a meal together in the name of you know, Christ is weird. And I think in a culture in which we want to cater to everyone's needs, communion is something that keeps us centered. To remember that this is not about you or about me. This is about Christ and what he did on the cross. Church is about his work, not ours. And so maybe you have been the victim of injustices or suffering. Maybe you're feeling lonely or you're struggling. This is a time where you can look forward and say, God is not done. He's not done with me. He's not done with his church. He's not done with the world. He's going to come 
and he's going to restore all things again. So look forward and remember that Jesus is coming to restore all things. Uh, let's keep reading. Verse 27 and 28 says this. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. So here's the third thing that I think you can do during communion. Look within. Examine your life with honesty and humility. You know, self-awareness may be just the, the most precious tool that we have to come to the Lord. It's just simply seeing yourself. Here's what self-awareness is. It's seeing ourselves the way that God sees us. It's seeing ourselves the way that God sees us. Not the way that you want to be seen. Not the way that you wish you were. The way that you actually are. The way that God sees you. And, and it takes actually quite an effort. Because we are really good at deceiving ourselves. And communion can be a time in which we can accomplish that. And the way by, that we do it is by looking back and looking forward. It's like by having points of reference. Uh, if you have ever tried to lay down some cones on a field to either make a square or make a line. You know, I remember doing that often, like every week when we do soccer drills, right? It's like you lay cones and you try to lay them in a line, in a straight line. And you look back and you see that the cones are like placed, you know, completely not in a, in a straight line. Unless... Here's what you do if you want to say cones in a straight line. You set the first one, and you set the last one. And then you, all you have to do is, like, as you said in the other ones, you look in between. You keep looking back and keep looking forward. And that allows you to set them in a straight line. And, and what you do is, when we examine our lives, you need to look at Christ, what He's done, and what He's going to do. And then you look within. You see, you ask some tough questions. You see if there's any sin you see if you're living a life the way that he wants you to li live. And this brings probably a question, right? What does it mean exactly to take the Lord's Supper in, in an unworthy manner? And, and the question probably is going to lead, is sin preventing me or would sin prevent me from taking the Lord's Supper? And the answer is absolutely not. Because if sin disqualified you from taking the Lord's Supper, then none of us could take the Lord's Supper ever. Okay, so... The, the Lord's Supper is actually meant to remind us, right, of the Passover. To remind us that, that Jesus rescued us from slavery to sin, to this world, to the wounds of this world. And, and so if you have sinned, I want to tell you, don't skip communion. In fact, you need communion more than ever. You need to take it. But you need to examine your life and not do it flippantly, you know, making grace cheap. But understanding that grace was dearly expensive. And Christ paid that price for you. Here's the other thing that you may wonder. Who can take communion, right? Maybe you're new with us. I'll tell you, the biblical answer is uh, those people that have decided to follow Jesus, who have confessed Him publicly and have been baptized. Like those are the people that can, can take communion. Now, some of you, you know, that were baptized probably even last week. You didn't know maybe, uh, you know, what baptism meant. Maybe you were baptized as a child and, and you, that's all you know. If that's the case, then I want to encourage you. You can, you know, be baptized by immersion as an adult because it's your own choice. And we had, can you believe we had 11 baptisms last week? That was awesome. I was telling, I was telling first service, it's like I was, you know, in a different country and there's a bunch of baptisms, so... I may be leaving again one of these days when we want more baptisms, right? It's, it's amazing, but if you confess Jesus, then you can take communion. Now, let's say that you're new and you didn't know you've taken communion without confessing Jesus publicly. Um, yeah, I don't think you need to be afraid, but here's what I want you to think about. Uh, taking communion without being, you know, having confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior publicly it's like trying to celebrate a wedding anniversary without doing the wedding ceremony. So you need to confess, you need to do the ceremony, and then you have an anniversary. You know, this is a remembrance of the commitment that, that you're making to Christ and that Christ is making with you. And so, so I would encourage you, if you haven't, you know, given your life to Christ, but you call Him, you know, in, in your heart, Lord, just do it publicly. And, uh, you know, and then... 
you'll be part of this celebration. You get to participate in this celebration. So you look within. And lastly, you look around. I want you to know you're not alone. Jesus' covenant is lived in community. Listen to the next few verses, verse 29 and on. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you were, are sick, weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Referring to death, actually. I want you to know, referring to death. But if you, we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. In other words, the Apostle Paul is trying to help them remember that at the end of the day, communion is not something that you just do alone. It's a shared act. It's being part of the body of Christ, of having that unity, of discerning that we are just a small part in the body of Christ. And so just I want you to, when you take communion, you know, many times we're tempted to just be right here, just us and God. Sometimes you can look around, regardless of your, you know, the color of your skin, regardless of your age, regardless of your status or your bank accounts or your education or your past. We are all one and the same before Christ. We're sinners who were brought, you know, out of that sin, out of that world, out of that hurt by Jesus, by grace. And so there should be no jealousy or contention or favoritism in the body of Christ. And so, and, and the other thing that I want to point out as we close is this. This is the only time, one of the few times, in which we see the discipline of the Lord on the body of Christ. We see God disciplining his children, right? He says, some of you are weak, some of you are sick, some of you have fallen asleep, some of you have died. Because the Lord didn't want to condemn you with the world, so he disciplined you. And for some of us, that's raising like our ears. I hope that you're paying attention, right? It's like, wow, like God takes this seriously. Now, you don't have to fear. Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that he's like a perfect in his discipline. He knows what's good for us, and his discipline will always lead to us getting closer to him. So you don't have to be afraid. He wants what's best for us. But the reason why he is stern as well it's because one of the greatest dangers that we have as followers of Jesus is this. To sit at his table and miss him completely. To go through the motions and not encounter him. And we're not the first one that that's happened to. In fact, the very first time that he established his supper, Jesus had a, a, one of his disciples, you know, just be at his table and miss him completely. Uh, let me show you. This is a picture of maybe the more, more likely, like the setup that Jesus had. So we usually see, um, you know, Da Vinci's picture, which is one table with chairs. More than likely, they were all reclining, as you read, as I read earlier. And it was a triclinium. So that means three tables in Roman style kind of set up with just, you know, some cushions or couches uh, around them, and people would sit on their left arm because they would eat with the right hand. And here's from the scriptures. We don't know where every disciple sat except three. We know probably where John sat, where Judas sat, and where Peter sat. We know that Peter was probably at the end because this was the servant's spot. This is the, the person that would have washed everybody's feet when they came in, would have served everybody, and would have served, served dinner, which is why when Jesus goes around washing everybody's feet, and gets to Peter. Peter is afraid. He's ashamed that he didn't wash everybody's feet. And so he's like, Jesus, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus says, yes, I will. And so he gets to them last. And we hear in that account. It probably is interesting to me because Peter was the more natural leader, and yet Jesus puts him in the servant spot. Okay, here's a tip for leadership for us today. Here's the second thing we know. We know that Peter told John from across the table, said, ask him, when Jesus said, the one who dips, you know, his bread in my cup is the one who's going to betray me, he asked John, who was right in front of him, and the Bible says that John was leaning on Jesus, so we know that John was on Jesus' right side because they leaned on their left side, 
And so John, uh, it's interesting that John was placed here because he was probably the youngest. So again, Jesus puts the more natural leader as a servant, and the one that looks, was looked down upon or was the youngest, the least of them all, he puts him right on his right hand. And here's the last thing we know. Judas is the one who dipped his bread his, in, into Jesus' cup, which means this. He was in the place of honor. Judas, John and Judas were sit, set at the right and the left hand of Jesus, and those were the spots of honor. And you wonder, how could Judas possibly be given a place of honor and still go right after this dinner and go betray the Lord? But the reality is that you and I have probably done the same. We have the same danger. To take this, to break it, to go through the motions and miss Jesus in the process. And today, I don't want you to do that anymore or ever again. We need to make communion sacred again. So we're going to take communion together today. So take your, your cups out. If you don't have them with you,